To the south of London, among the gently rolling downs of Sussex, near the village of Ditchley, dwells a singularly improbable personage named Emmett. Strolling through the quaint countryside, he seems no more extraordinary than a country squire taking the morning air. But to those who know... Typical English eccentric. <laughs> that must be the inventor. Hidden away inside a cunningly picturesque 18th century forge is Emmett's workshop. Here, like Dr. Frankenstein, new life is created from discarded bits and pieces. Emmett's monsters, however, are not pseudo-humans, but delicate and whimsical mock machines. This is the domain of Roland Emmett, the Ditchling Tinkerer. Emmett resides with his wife, Mary, at Wild Goose Cottage. Though nary a goose, wild or otherwise, is known to inhabit the immediate vicinity. Still, there is something a bit untamed about the premises. Objects have a tendency to disappear. The tinkerer is loose, collecting the necessary ingredients for a new creation. For Emmett combines ordinary oddments into extraordinary flights of imagination. His studio is a rather antique dovecot at the bottom of the garden. Here the metamorphosis begins, where a tea caddy and a seashell are integrated into a new Emmett Watchet. Roland Emmett first came to the world's attention as a cartoonist. His particular brand of nonsense has been described as a kind of deep dish Victorian parody of modern manners and technology, full of gentle Gothic whimsy. Most renowned of Emmett's graphic creations is the infamous far tottering in Oyster Bay Railway, a sometimes working model constructed for the Festival of Britain in 1951, flung Emmett deep into the mire of three-dimensional construction, an accident from which he has not yet extracted himself. Emmett's current mechanical muddle involves the creation of a clockwork lullaby machine, a portable hairdressing saloon, and a gentleman's moon rocket outfit, all improbable props for the motion picture Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang is a splendidly magical motor machine created by the Emmett-like inventor, Caractacus Potts, who's played by Dick Van Dyke in the film. Headquarters for the cinemization of the Ian Fleming story is England's Pinewood Studios, where that well-known cast of thousands has been toiling for months to bring the musical to the screen. Creation of this phantasmagorical entertainment presented producer Albert Broccoli with a pride of problems, signing the perfect cast, including Dick Van Dyke, Sally Ann Howes, Heather Ripley and Adrian Hall, Gert Froby, James Robertson Justice, and Lionel Jeffries. This was only one problem to be resolved. Finding the right location was another, for filming took place in France and Bavaria as well as England. And then there were the huge musical numbers to stage. These were large, massive problems, easily dealt with by the man who helped bring James Bond to the screen. More difficult was the delicate and crispy puzzle of creating the manic machines Van Dyke as Caractacus Potts invents in the film. to be found. Where but Dishling and Roland Emmett, who so perfectly personifies Potts' potty approach to technology. 
I became involved in this film for various reasons. I've uh, built a great number of uh, rather pathetic inventions in the past, and uh, I believe that the uh, sponsors of the film could see some affinity between Caractica Spots, who of course is Dick Van Dyke, and myself. We both try very, very hard, but uh, never quite pull off what we're after. I've made, I think it's eight devices in all for this picture. I think one could say from design to finish. Uh, that's uh, six or seven months it took me to make these. Once completed, Emmett moved his splendid gaggle of gigaws to Studio K Pinewood and the set of Potts Workshop. Now this is the Potts Clockwork Lullaby Machine. Uh, there's a little array of cat bells at the top which join in, and the amplifier is a great seashell uh, backed up by a horn, which is uh, a sheet of music from one of the Brahms lullabies. But it's, it's rather confused thinking. Now, the thing about Potts is that he was always ahead of his time, and here we have Visivision, which was his idea of, well, I suppose we must say television, uh, his idea of anyway snatching pictures out of the air in 1910 uh, it's not entirely successful and although it does uh, produce here a picture and in color uh, it seems to have got stuck on one picture the pot's sunflower washing up machine now, this is rather a dreadful thing and i think it's one of caractacus pot's least successful uh, ventures <laughs> This is the little dragon suction cleaner. This little dragon is a most temperamental little beast, and if it loses its temper, it either suddenly chews the carpet to shreds or sucks up the entire carpet, which is never seen again. People often think of me and my machines as eccentric. I think this is awful. We're not eccentric, any of us. Uh, we're different, yes, but I think, now, my machinery, this is the way machines ought to go. I granted it doesn't do the job, but still. Now, this is a, a large, full-bodied machine of most imposing proportions. It's uh, really for making lollipops and toffee apples and jelly babies. Um, it seems to do all right with the toffee apples. The jelly baby situation's rather confused. The most astounding thing about this machine, however, is that it suddenly and inexplicably begins to produce a magic whistling sweet, which has a great deal to do in the film and actually later makes Caractacus Pot's fortune. You know, I've spent an awful long time with these things, and when you've done that, you grow very attached to them. At least I do. I've grown very attached to these things, and I know them all by name, and, you know, they're temperamental, and sometimes they, they won't play, sometimes they will. And, you know, you go around, you have a word here and there, and you give them a pat and so on. I don't know, they're like a family to me. And when I lock up the workshop at night and go away, I often wonder what they get up to, or whether they just sit there waiting for me to come back, and whether they think about me as I do about them, or whether... You know, just what does go on after the door is shut at night? Oh, well, I suppose I shall never know.